Are you finding yourself having conversations about the lack of safety in our cities? How do we protect ourselves while we're hearing that the police is defunded? Additional gun laws against law-abiding citizens are being pushed while more criminals are on the streets. Bryce Eddy from Covered Six has given me incredible hands-on advice on how to navigate through these intense times. I hope you'll find this episode of Real Talk helpful. Bryce, I wanted to have a conversation with you about guns and safety and security. And specifically, I wanted to speak to you about this because you're really boots on the ground. You're not just theoretical. You're not just, you know, studying the issues in a scholarly way, which we have a lot of access to here at PragerU. Mm-hmm. But wanted to speak to somebody who is actually working with a company that is providing security both to citizens and to government and training people on guns. And so you guys wear so many hats in really helping people get more sane mm-hmm. uh, and, and bring more common sense to this whole guns debate, if you want to call it even a debate. And I think it's just so important that we don't just speak in the terms in terms of theory, but really in terms of practice. What can we do? We're experiencing, you know, real crime, uh, but also a real debate about what should be done with guns. And so oftentimes I'll go to a birthday party and parents will come up to me and say, well, Marissa, how can you be pro-guns? Do you not love your children? Do you want your kids to die? Do you want your kids to die in a, in, in a gun shooting? And, and obviously the answer for many of us conservatives, God forbid, I mean, I love my kids more than anything in the whole world. Of course I don't want that, but I do want pragmatic results. And I do want to feel that we can grow up in a world where there is some safety, some autonomy over our safety, um, and really pragmatic solutions. And so that's why I wanted to bring you in to really answer some of these very complex questions in a very tricky world that we're living in right now, where things are so polarized that if you say one wrong word about guns, or if you describe the guns in the wrong way, you're suddenly just attacked on social media. How can we aim for better safety and better security while still having, you know, the Second Amendment rights that we all want to have? And so if you can just start with a little bit of your background, how did you get into doing what you're doing? Yeah, sure. Uh, Well, thank you for having me. I'm a little bit of a many-layered onion. I wear a lot of hats and have a lot of things that I do. I with Covered Six, which is the, the name of our company, we're a vocational training school for military veterans, and I, I'm responsible for kind of strategy and, and risk and a number of other uh, things within the, the business. And um, we saw, um, Chris Dunn, who's our, our founder and CEO, saw more than 10 years ago, I think we're going on 13 years now, that active shooter and things like that. I mean, that's the genesis for starting the company was going to be on the rise. And we were going to be moving into a time of um, really great violence. And we saw the pattern of this happening because of what they were doing with law enforcement. You're seeing some of the very same things happening with military right now. You're seeing a lot of the um, diminishment of those folks in our society. You're seeing a, a you know kind of uprising of crime. Uh, anybody who lives in a city right now is seeing that happening. Um, there's actual campaigns to almost promote violence or at the very least not prosecute things. And if you are not enforcing laws, then it's as if the laws don't exist. So we're in a, a, a little bit of a world of hurt right now, and it's only going to get worse. And so uh, like you're talking about with, with folks that you're at birthday parties with, and some of those same people that maybe a year ago were going, oh, how could you have a gun in the home are secretly calling us and saying, don't tell anybody, but I need a gun. And, and we're seeing that happen more and more. Um, unfortunately, uh, the gun is not a holy talisman. But that's how a lot of people treat it, you know. Oh, I need a gun. Okay, now I'm safe. Um, and we we discourage that because I don't think everyone should own a gun. I don't think guns are right for everyone. I don't think they're necessarily right for most people. Um, they they come with a tremendous amount of responsibility, um, just like uh, any kind of fighting or martial art. They require that level of dedication, I believe, to be proficient. You're fighting with a weapon. It is fighting. So you need to be training with it. You need to be um, you know, growing with it. You need to have that level of commitment. And a lot of people aren't prepared for that. So there's other things that we recommend as well. I want to bring up some of the birthday party questions that I've been sure. uh, assaulted with 
<laughs> over the last few months, I guess I would say. And so people will come up to me and say, Marissa, how can you not be pro-gun control? Don't you think it's absurd that somebody can walk into a Walmart and pick up an assault rifle and, you know, two hours later go and shoot somewhere? Can, can you just respond to that? Like, how true is that? First yeah, well, of all, and yeah. Well, it's not. It's not true. Um, you know, there are there are really uh, effective uh, and tight laws on the books for you know how you uh, obtain weapons, and there are background checks that are um, pretty detailed. You know, there's a difference between background check when you're going to go and get a job, where they. Um, you know, ch check your employment history, make sure that you aren't a felon, although, you know, these days that only goes back so far. Uh, but, you know, there's there's kind of that level of background check. And then there's what the FBI does when you're applying for a firearm. And, and it is far more detailed. And so there's nothing really wrong with those background checks. Um, the idea of someone just, you know, hey, that day conceiving of I'm going to go and kill a bunch of people going into Walmart. You know, that is not a widespread occurrence. And most people in this debate are not arguing from a position of good faith. The majority of what you see on that side uh, is either confusion, you know, so people just don't really know um, how the laws work. Um, they don't really know what's going on. They have no clue about firearms. You know, they're talking about automatic weapons, which are really semi-automatic weapons. They're talking about, you know, weapons of war, which is a meaningless term uh, because pistols are used in war, knives are used in war. You know, they, there's all these things that they're pumping up um, the, and, and people buy that stuff, you know, that confusion. But the people who are promoting those ideas and really pushing them, like the, the media or, or those that are their allies, really want gun disarmament. Mm -hmm. and, and so how can you sit across the table from someone who that's their goal and actually argue for common sense gun laws? Because mm -hmm. that's not what they're after. I would love to sit with somebody on the other side and, hey, we come together meeting in the minds. How do we solve these issues? And we could actually probably come up with some great things. Right. Well, I really want to take this conversation beyond the conversation that politicians are having. Right. Because honestly, I feel like on both sides, I'm not sure that I'm very happy. I feel like Agreed. they failed us on many levels. So the real, I want to go into the like the real deal. What yeah. should we should actually advocate for? My question is with regards to actual gun laws that are on the books right now, what laws are actually on the books? Are they even being enforced? Because what is what is the point of having more laws for more people who are abiding citizens while the criminals essentially have already laws that they're not even following. And so really, what is the point in all of that? What laws exist today that you are seeing are not actually being enforced? Oh, well, I, I think we're seeing it outside of the gun debate. I mean, the gun debate and, and you know, gun laws and all stuff is just one thing that we're talking about here. But anybody who's been paying attention knows that most of our laws are not being properly enforced right now. You're seeing that with, you know, all, all kinds of, you know, criminal codes that aren't being enforced or many things that were felonies being moved down to misdemeanors. You've got that happening all over the place. And gun laws are a part of that. So we're mm -hmm. seeing that in our inner cities where people, you know, with illegal weapons, you know, are, are not being prosecuted. People using um, weapons in the commission of a crime aren't properly being prosecuted. So it's, it's as if many of these laws now are just arbitrary or not actually being enforced at all. Then you go to the things that people are crying out for on a federal level, like red flag laws. Red flag laws exist in 12 or more, um, I think it's more than 12 states now already, including uh, Chicago, where we have that Highland Park shooting. I think that that kid for that shooting had a rap song that had thousands of views where he was talking about shooting up a school. He uh, predicted and said that he would. And so that's where red flag laws are supposed to apply. But those weren't being enforced in that situation. The... Um, Part of the red flag laws that I'm concerned about and people who believe in the Second Amendment and, and I wholeheartedly do, um, I believe it's very necessary. Um, and with something like that, you're going to get good and bad from any kind of freedom, right? So we have to take that in consideration. But red flag laws will be used against political enemies. So whoever is in charge at the time will be using those red flag laws 
on a because they're subjective. They will be using them, uh, you know, in order to to you know thwart or jam up their enemies, and and that will happen on both sides. So red flag laws are essentially if you identify, let's say, a family member or let's say a student in the case of young folks that seems to be not fit to own a weapon because they're mentally unstable or they've right. repeatedly mentioned that they would, you know, want to kill animals or or right. even humans, right? And so the the point of red flag laws is that mom or a family member can go and report, hey, I think my child, something's wrong with them. I, 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 I'm, I'm worried that they're going to go buy a gun. Right. So that's my understanding of, and, and yeah. forgive me, by the way, I'm completely ignorant about guns. You know, my husband does own guns and, and he's gone through all the- And he's competent, you know, yeah. Right, he is very competent and he trains with you guys regularly. But I don't know that much, so if I get these terms wrong, no, please okay. don't attack me. If I, uh, so you we're know, we're going to get like, hate on both sides right, anyway. Uh, right. So I know. You get, I mean, wrong, that's what they do. Matter. It's that that's exactly why nobody yeah. can have a conversation. Because I mean, literally, people are afraid to have a conversation about it, given that you say one wrong word and you just get an onslaught. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just really want to get the real deal. I really want to understand this. And so, if mom sees that her child has something wrong with them, can mom report this somewhere? Um, yeah, and she should. And, and right now, you can report those things to the police. Um, you know, we've been involved in things where we've been called in to similar situations, and and um, you know, we've had folks that um, you know were making threats against their family members, and at the same time, you know, posting. Um, pictures of weapons everywhere, like lying on their beds and, you know, drug paraphernalia and things like that. And unfortunately for us to actually put pressure on the particular sheriff's department, um, you know, that, that we were calling on behalf of this family and saying, you guys need to take this seriously. Um, you know, and, and law enforcement, I mean, they, they've got a tough job. There's wonderful people in it. I, I believe that it's being uh, intentionally um, hollowed out and, and we can touch on that. Um, but but they weren't going to respond, and uh, and they had you know every right. There are laws on the books now that that are strong enough for them to go and and deal with that situation. Um, and we knew that some of those guns, based on the pictures, were illegal. There were you know there was a whole bunch of levers that they could pull, and and we had to um, I'm going to say guilt them into it by saying okay if something happens. Who are you? What's your name? Okay, we're reporting this. We're, yeah. We have you on record right. now. If something occurs, that you're the one that did not go and do this. And then they ended up, um, you know, wrapping this guy up, and um, you know, we had him successfully prosecuted. And, and um, you know, thankful, you know, the, the family was a part of that whole process. Very tough for them, but we did it. Um, right now, that's an example of a lot of those laws not being properly enforced. Mm -hmm. And and again. Police departments, sheriff's departments are stretched thin. You know, there's all kinds of things that are going on. They are not as robust as they used to be. They're not filled with, you know, brave men and women in the same way that they used to be. They still exist, but but their hiring practices and things like that have hauled them out. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is in the vast majority of places around America, there are gun laws, but the, the or or laws in general, but the laws are not being enforced either because the police doesn't have enough bandwidth or because of you know, criminal justice reform or any of these different issues. Ironically, I think that these laws are not being enforced in places where there are more people who are advocating yeah. for more federal gun laws, including the uh, you know revisit of the Second Amendment, if not like yeah. the complete... The, uh, uh, the skeptic in me is, is concerned about that because it seems like, that, hey, this is falling in line perfectly for them. Yeah. If, we just, if we let these things go, go yeah. on, if we pay no attention to these things, then we get right. what we want, which is tragedies that help us push our goal, which is gun confiscation. Right. And again, they, there is a, a not, most people that are arguing for a lot of these additional laws are not arguing from from a good faith standpoint. Right. I mean, we live in L.A. And so my first reaction, you're pushing for more laws, but you're not even enforcing the right. laws that we have here. A friend of mine uh, just had this horrible incident a few weeks ago where there are a couple of thugs, thugs that showed up to her door uh, and the ring kind of like captured the picture of them mm -hmm. looking around, looking under the mat, looking on the windows, trying to break in. And so she started yelling through the ring saying, you know, we're home, you know, leave the house we see you. And they just kept going. They kept going at it. 
And eventually, you know, they really had to take the self-reliance and they didn't luckily didn't have to shoot anybody, but they did yeah. have to con confront the thugs. And so you're seeing in areas like L.A., Chicago, New York, these places that do have actual a lot of gun laws, a situation where people just lose faith in the system's ability to protect them. And so all of us who want to protect our children and our families and, and our belongings are stepping into this situation where we're like calling you secretly and saying, yeah. hey, can you train me? Can can you let me know where I can buy a gun so I can protect myself? Ironically, these same places are the places that are pushing for, you know, uh, defunding the police and having less sources yeah. for, for safety and security. And so, uh, you know, I, in my mind, there are three groups of people who buy guns. My guess is that it's not a fast growing group, but these are for people who do it for recreational sports. Right. Uh, and the media seems to kind of leave them alone somewhat. Uh, the second group is the growing group of people that I know who have lost faith in the system's ability to protect themselves because they are seeing this rampant growth of violence, not just with guns, but violence all around uh, in our cities and partially because of what the media and our education is propagating this kind of like hate-filled uh, um, class and, and division and et cetera. And so there's this growing group of people who just feel unsafe and want to take safety into their own hands, uh, the secret buyers. And then there's the third group of people that I think the media just loves to hate. Yeah. And those are the supposed Republican militias who make no sense because they think they're going to uprise against the tyrannical government. And like, you know, I just watched a PBS documentary on how they just zone into these, uh, the, you know, the gun lovers who want to create their own militias. And I, I mean, I just think that it's a very dishonest uh, portrayal of yeah. who's buying guns right now. Do you agree? I, I do agree. And, and you know, let's talk about that third category for a moment, because uh, those folks, I, I know some of those folks. Now, when I say that, I know the people that they're labeling as those folks, right? Yeah. And, and a lot of them have, I think, some very valid concerns because we are seeing political prisoners right now in the United States. Yeah. We've got people that have been, you know, in prison for um, misdemeanors right now, you know, our supposed J6 folks and, you know, things like that, um, you know, and there's, and so the people that are saying, hey, I'm concerned that, you know, they're coming to confiscate my weapons, um, you know, are, are some of those people that are going, you know what, I'm going to get what I can now uh, before it's too late. So there are people that, that have that thought process. I don't think it's um, necessarily healthy to have that thought process. I do know that they aren't people that are actively working towards a you know coup of an uprising, but they are concerned about their rights being taken away. And what we've seen, we've seen enough evidence that that uh, I'm sympathetic to their concerns. Yeah. Um, but they're they're of course going to be painted and labeled as nut jobs and crazies. At the same time, these folks that are that are saying this in the media are going, we shouldn't have guns, no guns should exist, and then we have the politicians that are doing that too, and they will um, not give up their security. They are going to still hire uh, those of us with weapons to follow them around and keep them safe. What they want to do is prevent people, and this is why I think this is wild, is we are going down to that lowest common denominator of having to be self-reliant because, you know, civilization mm -hmm. is, is essentially failing. And then at the same time, they don't want all of us down here as our cities are falling to pieces and we do have follow home burglaries and things like that happening every day now in a way that they didn't in the past. They want to then eliminate our ability to defend ourselves. Yeah. I mean, big government hates self-reliance, right? Oh, well, exactly. It, yeah. You know, self-reliance is an antidote to that. So they don't want that. Yeah. Self-reliant people are very diff difficult to control. Yeah. You also mentioned something that I do have a strong opinion about, and that is the school safety. Yeah. Um, and how much hypocrisy there is in that in that area. Yeah. And so, you know, the fancy people, including include not just fancy people. I mean, Jews have realized a long time ago that we have to hire private security armed guns for our schools. Yeah. And so I've asked for years, well, why can't we have armed, you know, security for government schools? I don't like to call these public schools government schools. Yeah. Why can't the government fund 
private security? Is it, it is it really a financial issue? Because if it really is a financial issue, I have unraveled a secret stash of money that the government <laughs> has been spending yeah. in a very silly way. Five hundred million dollars per year is basically given in grants to PBS, public broadcasting station, to make educational videos uh, for children, which I think now there are plenty of educational videos, including PragerU for free, where we take no money from the government. Uh, But there are many other for-profit organizations that make educational videos. And meanwhile, the government spends millions and millions uh, on education for our children through these shows. So why not take that $500 million and invest that in security for our kids? And what is, what are you seeing? Yeah, or they could just get rid of one administrator for a school and, and hire security. <laughs> one yeah. less DEI person would solve it. <laughs> I was going to say that, yeah. yeah. No, it'd be, yeah, that would be great. Um, no, we could do it. I mean, there's uh, the way I look at it, I look at it in categories, right? We have short-term solutions you know, that we need to do, or immediate solutions. Then we have intermediate solutions, right? And then we have the long-term. In that short-term category, um, yeah, let's harden these targets, right? And let it, let's put in you know, real security professionals. And, you know, when, when Chris Dunn, who's our, our owner and founder, conceived of this, again, it was brought forth in um, active shooter times. It was, okay, hey, this is going to get worse. And, and so we immediately started working with a lot of private schools, of course, that were the first ones to go, okay, we need to do this. We're in areas that are falling to pieces and we need to have trained professionals. And they aren't the, you know, mall cop types. I mean, these are, um, you know, for us, we're a vocational trained school for military veterans. So we're repurposing vets, excellent, awesome people that are ready to find their, you know, their next uh, purpose in life and their natural protectors. And let's put them in, in campuses and have them trained. And, and, you know, let's make sure that we know the ingress and egress in these schools are protected so that people can't, you know, wander onto campuses and, you know, through unlocked doors and wreak havoc. Um, so, yes, we can do that. The argument against that, a lot of folks, uh, oh, I, I, that's going to traumatize my kid if they see a police officer or an armed security officer on school. That is a, an absolute Oh, I can joke. tell you that from experience. Yeah. My children are not traumatized by that. The opposite. No, and, and, and you, you, know, you hire like you hire for anything else. You hire friendly, engaging, you know, loving people that are competent at their job. And the kids are going to be, you know, hey, high-fiving the security guy, and they're excited. And, and then there, there is that level of comfort and protection, you know, in this world that is falling to pieces. So that's, that's, that's a non-argument. It's, it's silly, um, childish. Uh, you know, then, so, so we, we do need to do that. And we can do that in a, a, you know, a bunch of different ways. And again, we're successfully doing it. Um, Is there a good argument? I just, have we heard one good argument? Why should we not have armed security in government schools? No, I don't think there is, but it usually comes down to expense. Um, Mm -hmm. And if you were going to put a sheriff on on school grounds or a police officer that, you know, comes from one of the local departments, that is about twice as expensive as, as, you know, engaging us and and putting a um, armed, trained security guard uh, on school grounds. And that's just, you know, the economics of it. It's because in everything through cases, the government is more expensive, basically. Yeah, and there's you know there's pensions and there's things to pay for. Our right. guys get paid well, but they you know don't have uh, you know government uh, bloat uh, yeah. on top of this. So yeah. um, you know the private sector can always do things more effectively and less expensive than the government, and that you know you know I know you guys talk about that. Yeah. Um, so so no, there is not a good argument for that. Um, they, the concern is that there's so many and it's going to be this massive expense, but you know we could find the money. Money gets wasted tremendously. <coughs> PBS. <coughs> yeah. PBS is a great example. <laughs> I, I say let's get rid of one or two administrators for every school. It'll run better right. anyway. Um, but yeah, so we could do that. I don't see any valid arguments. Why not? So, I mean, do you know why it's not being done? I mean... I- yeah, because they don't really care about the kids. Uh, they see this as politically um, beneficial to them. And, and so I don't think that um, any of their arguments hold any water because they're arguing from the position of getting rid of Second Amendment, making sure that the average citizen cannot have a firearm or defend themselves. Mm-hmm. So we covered some of the obvious common sense stuff that should be done, right? It's right. Like, at least if you have already laws, enforce the laws. Yeah. Uh, if you have schools without armed guards, just damn it, find the money and get those armed guards in there. Uh, you know, 
red flag laws have their pros and have their and and have their cons, but certainly there should be the ability to inform the police if if, yeah. if a relative sees that there is somebody who who is problematic. Let's talk about what what we can do. What can I do? Well, like as a just as let's, a citizen. Let's get there, but if I can, I want to make one more point along those lines. Sure. Because there's there's this pushback right now because of Uvalde, Texas, on the good guy with a gun. See, a good guy with a gun does not solve the problem because you had that department, which we're walk, watching right now, um, those police officers did not go in and did not take that guy well, out. Well, I feel like that is more of an argument that police can't do all the work for us. Yeah. And it's even more so that we'd need a good guy with a gun. Because yeah. ultimately it well, was the good guy it, with a gun in it, Indiana it was, also. It was, and I'll tie, and I'll tie these together. Um, because right now, you know, with the, um, you know, what I'm calling the diminishing, because it is, yes, it's defunding, it's a whole bunch of things, but diminishing the role of the police and protectors in our society, which do include private security. And it does include, um, you know, trained civilians as well. Um, you, we need to get back to the warrior mentality that exists in human beings, not in every human being. Men. But men who have <laughs> courage, because there are, there are plenty of men I know that, that in that situation would have launched themselves like missiles into the fray in order to, to kill that and guy. Uvalde. And Uvalde. And, and Uvalde, and would have happily taken bullets on the way in so that the next guy could get him. What happened um, with the police? Why did they not do that? Uh, well, um, I think hiring practices, I think the training that they're being given now, there's this thing that's going on in local police departments, and I don't want to call too many people out, but um, but we have this concept of tactical patience that is literally something that uh, local law enforcement is starting to talk about now. You tactical should have patience, patience while that children are being back, shot? Hang back and see what happens. And, oh, let's wait. You saw in that video, and again, more of this is coming out. And I, you know, I, I'm not omniscient. I don't know all about what what happened in you know in every instance in this. But as the picture is becoming more clear, you saw a guy get you know get some hand sanitizer. You know, people try to make excuses about that. None of those fly. You saw a guy sitting, leaning against the wall, and his, and then you saw them physically holding back some of the guys that were like, "We need to go," because the time in an active shooter, you have seconds. You need to go, and you need to go quickly. And you need to take those guys that will launch themselves in like they are human missiles into that situation. And you need to teach them good sound tactics and, and everything else that goes along with having that spirit of I'm going to courageously go in here and end this. And then you did have the you know, Bo Border Patrol you know, agents that finally got there. They did that. They right. went in and went in immediately right. and, and, uh, and handled the situation. So yeah. you need that to exist in our culture and that needs to also exist in civilians. So going to your point with um, you know individuals, like what can people do? I am a huge advocate of training. I am a huge advocate of if you're gonna make a commitment to carrying a firearm or having a firearm in your home, you need to go and get trained on how do I clear the rooms in my house? Um, where do I carry, how do I carry? Um, you know, what do I do when the police get there? All of those little pieces you need to, you need to understand. And then you also need to, to take sort of the, um, the stoic uh, concept of fear setting, which is mentally rehearsing. Okay, someone comes into my house. Uh, you know, what, what would I do? What am I going to feel? Oh, my gosh. You know, you have to kind of do that so that the, the occurrence is not new. It's mm. already in there. Um, in all of our training, we create an adrenal response. You know, we put you under pressure. We, uh, we use UTM in our building, which is like simunition rounds. We shoot back at you. We put bad guys in the room, you know, and there are, and, and we're not the only training company that does this. We don't do a whole lot of civilian training. Um, you know, we're doing mostly our uh, vets that we're again, preparing for the world of security, but that's the kind of training that you need to do. You need to be put under pressure and pressure test your reactions. And, and you need to inoculate yourself a little against that adrenal response, that panic, that, you know, loss of fine motor skills, all of that. I want to address two things that you said. One is this concept that our law enforcement officers have been taught to be more passive. And in their defense, I would imagine that part of it is because, I mean, they're probably just fearful of every mm -hmm. move they make. And they make the tiniest wrong move. And not only is their career over, but their whole family's life is over. And I'd imagine that it's, it's, it's probably very difficult to have, 
you know, millions of eyeballs on you at every moment in time. And yeah. so this like inaction is probably part of that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll address that. So first, uh, you know, qualified immunity. Okay, uh, they are um, ministers of justice. That is their role in our society, right? They are, they are um, that first step, that line of defense, you know, in, in keeping an orderly um, uh, world and civilization. So they are ministers of defense. They, when they take on that job, they take on their, that responsibility and they take on that risk. I might, I might get, you know, shot and killed in a line of duty and protecting others. As a result of that, we give them um, special legal protection. The fact that they have made moves to remove that special legal protection means that in the back of their mind, every situation that they're going into, um, in this environment, I'm going to get sued. I'm going to get, uh, you know, taken through, um, you know, the world's worst um, process, and they're going to try to try to hang me. And uh, how how can I go into that? So, you know what? Time heals all calls. Ooh, I'm not going to go to that one. Oh, we'll hang back. We'll see how that develops. I mean, there's those are natural reactions to you know law enforcement officers if you're putting them out there where they have no agreed upon societal contract that they are in a different category and have different responsibilities than the rest of us. The second thing I wanted to address, and I don't know if this is what you were trying to say, but I'm inspired by it, if, if it was, <laughs> and that is that almost like in a perfect world, we find more people who are interested in stepping up and are interested in being that good guy with a gun uh, or a good woman with a gun, mm -hmm. uh, properly trained, uh, properly mentally ready to do that. But what if we had a society where more people are able to step up and really save us from these terrible situations? Because while there is a situation where people are going to get a hold of guns, people who are sick or the way I like to call it, pure evil and want to do horrible things, if we have more people stationed uh, in places all over that can protect us and yeah. know how to handle that. Indiana is a perfect example. Yeah. Uvalde is a perfect example. Almost every single time, it ends up not being a law enforcement officer necessarily, but somebody who is capable and knows how to handle a weapon. And so yeah. maybe there is a calling for a new wave of, of security that supports our law enforcement officers with people who you know, have the proper training and proper abilities to just be an extra set of security for for citizens. Yeah, and and you know, obviously we're doing it. You know, we've done some of the first of its kind private public partnerships with law enforcement, where we are putting out in the field because some of it they are having a hard time doing it in the same way. And and you know, we're working with amazing departments that that still have the mentality I'm talking about, and are surrounded by. Uh, lawlessness because they're, you know, tiny departments that go, hey, we need help. All right. right. So, you know, so they partner with us, um, you know, and our guys are in the field running actual police calls and working with them in partnership with them. We have the same radios. We're there. We're getting to scenes sometimes before they are. And our guys are the type of warrior that you need in those situations and they're doing it. Um, we do need it in the citizenry as well mm -hmm. because, yeah, you saw that in Indiana where it was a good guy with a gun. And again, good does not mean nice, but I think they conflate that, oh, a nice guy right. with a gun. No, a good guy means a courageous person who, right. is, who is willing to step into the fray yeah. who and, helps and solve end, a problem. Who helps end the yeah. evil, right? Yeah, a protector, you know, and the police departments have stopped intentionally hiring protectors like they do not want and this is not the true of every department and I don't want to throw them all under the bus but remember you have political leadership that is driving right. these, a lot of these decisions and that includes we're not going to hire military vets mm -hmm. we're not going to hire people that that come from that warrior class in the mm -hmm. same way oh in the interview like guys have to be very careful about how they interview for those jobs because what they're wanting is somebody who is far more passive, brought them mm -hmm. down, not the people that are going out there and doing intentional policing. Because so much of policing is going out there and seeing suspicious folks and identifying, oh, they're up to no good and right. playing on those instincts and things like that. And they've made that racial issues. They've made that, you know, um, all kinds of things that it is not. Yeah. I know many of them are your close friends and I yeah. know you defend them all the time. And, and again, I'm just going to say to their defense We've created a culture that basically makes it impossible for them to do their job. And so yeah. they're they're asked to be passive and the culture is at expecting them to be passive. Oh, let's send social workers instead of police yeah. officers. Right. And so it's like, OK, well, 
I guess I can behave like a social worker and not like a police officer. Yeah, um, so we had a NASCAR guy at uh, the gas station, uh, um, you know, get stabbed by a homeless man the other day. Um, you know, the, those sort of things are happening all the time. What is that social worker going to do in that situation with that same homeless man in that intervention without, you know, a good, courageous, strong guy or a gal with a gun there to protect them? Yeah, I would say that anybody out there who is reasonable and is watching is probably thinking what I'm thinking. And that is, I love the police. I wish they were not placed in a situation where they can't do their job. Uh, I don't believe in defunding the police. I want more police officers. I don't know that I can handle protecting myself, but maybe I should try. But I do realize that I'm in a place in society where I do need to take matters to protect myself better because I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm afraid to go to sleep at night when, you know, my husband's out of town yeah. or even when my husband is in town, we're having conversations about how we're going to protect our family. And I think a lot of viewers, if they're really honest about it and they put the politics aside and they don't talk about, you know, yes, gun control, not gun control. Yeah. We know that these criminals are getting a hold of guns and they're going to get a hold of guns anyway. What what can we do? This is what yeah, you do yeah. so, all day. So, okay, you give so that I'll, kind I'll, of hit, advice. I'll hit a couple of things. First, you are not going to get rid of guns. Okay, the only way you're going to get rid of guns is if we could, you know, poof them out of existence all at once, right? Can I poof more things yeah. out of existence while we do that, by the way? Let's compare <laughs> lists. Yeah. Let's compare lists. No, I mean, if you could Im immediately, all the guns were psh, disappeared off this planet, okay, then, you know, maybe you could get rid of them for a time. But then, you know, people are going to develop weaponry and, and we have all kinds of technology where you can create guns. Um, but the ones that are in existence uh, now, there's, you know, 400 million guns plus in existence now. You're not going to get those out of anyone's hands other than the law-abiding citizens that voluntarily right. go and turn them in if they try to confiscate them right. from us. So and the ones all that of are us no want solutions now, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 that's, so that's a big problem. Solutions now, what can you do? Um, I'll, I'll give just the self-defense tips, you know, kind of 101, and I've written articles on this. Number one, we need to increase people's self-awareness. You know, we're walking around heads buried in our phones, um, pumping gas at the gas station. You know, before that homeless guy gets up to you with a knife, you need to know what's around you. You know, don't sit there pumping the gas, standing outside, you know, tweeting, you know, your, your friends or whatever. Yeah. You know, you need to be aware, head up, looking around, paying attention to the environment you're in. That also uh, lends to presence. You know, if I'm standing tall, if I'm, you know, out there, I'm paying attention, they see all of that happening, that's right. Um, I can't do it, I'm yeah. so small. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but don't, you know, don't diminish that because you standing, looking like you're confident and paying mm -hmm. attention tells, they, they, they want to sneak up on people. Mm -hmm. They want to go to people who are, you know, withdrawn, not paying attention. That's 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 who they pick. Huh, they good. don't pick so, somebody that looks like they're going to be noisy, fight back, scratch, scream, yeah. and create a scene. You know, they they want to catch somebody unawares if they can. Yeah. So so you're you're going to eliminate a lot of threat just based on that. Mm -hmm. um, at home, uh, you know, have a big dog. You know, they, 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 that's one of the number one things that, that we say. Um, because, you know, people will go to the next house. Ooh, the, you know, there's a big Rottweiler in there, which is what I have. Um, yeah, big Rottweiler. We'll move to the next, next home. Um, have intelligent cameras. Uh, ring. You know, your friend with the ring system. That was great. You know, able to see, okay, there's a problem here. Um, you can, you know, speak over it. Uh, yeah, hey, get out of here. You know, I'm, pay I'm paying attention to you. All of that stuff makes sense. So, you know, little things like that. If you are going to have weapons and you're uncomfortable with a gun, there is pepper spray. Pepper spray works. Is um, it? I thought pepper spray was not effective because it can spray back at you. And um, it just, like, there's pepper sprays and there's pepper gel. So pepper gel, when I say pepper spray, it's kind of the category, but pepper gels are great in windy cities and, uh, you know, uh, don't have kind of the blow, blow back. And yes, if you walk into a cloud of pepper spray, you know, uh, just getting it secondhand, it's pretty miserable. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that, that, that is a category that works. It's not perfect. You know, yeah. um, it, it takes a little bit of time to set in, uh, you know, in our academy, we spray everybody, we have them run a course, uh, bead bags, fight a little bit, and then they sit in absolute misery for the next hour, sweating and snot coming out of their, their faces. But um, it, it is effective. Um, mm -hmm. Again, not perfect, and no solution, including a gun, is, is perfect. Mm -hmm. Tasers. 
tasers are are awesome. Um, you, you know, taser, which is very different than stun gun. Um, stun guns are are not that effective, and stun guns you have to get up close and personal with. Tasers also have the stun gun ability with them, but, but they, fire, they fire they uh, fire darts attached by filament electrodes that deliver a lot of juice into your body and you get to ride the lightning. So do you Pancake. think you think somebody like me mm -hmm. should walk around with like a pouch and a taser? I like love when that I go idea. to Costco? I love that idea. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I love that you get trained on it, but it's not necessary. I recommend it, but you don't have to have special licensing. Uh, it's not a firearm. It uses a, a compressed nitrogen cartridge to fire the darts. The probes have little, you know, little needles on the end with barbs and they go pretty deep into your skin. They'll penetrate into plywood. I mean, they're pretty gnarly. You know, take a little yeah, bit of energy to pull them out. You can drop the taser, run away, and that person's gonna ride that lightning for 30 seconds of great misery. So mm -hmm. it works. If you are gonna have a firearm, you need to train. You need to go to a place where they are going to teach you, not just you know sitting here static firing at a target. You want a place where you're moving and you're learning principles of self-defense and fighting with a handgun. Yeah, I love this conversation because I think people view conservatives or people who honor the Second Amendment as those who believe that anybody should just go buy a gun and make a collection of guns and like play with the guns and hand the guns to their four-year-olds and. This is a complete wrong picture of those who honor the Second Amendment. People who honor the Second Amendment honor also the very careful treatment of guns and Absolutely. the training uh, that goes into it. And I think that mo more people should have that perspective. Yeah. And no, and we teach our kids. I mean, my all three of my girls can shoot. All three of my girls have, have been trained in all of the basics of, of firearm safety um, at an early age. And now they actually can shoot and they can shoot well. Um, so I, I advocate that, you know, we, we keep our guns secured. And again, my kids and their friends and all that stuff are in this community, which is the most important thing in keeping us all safe is community. But we all understand what we're doing and we're careful with these things. Yeah. I mean, you live in a great neighborhood. God yeah. forbid something happens. I'm, I'm coming over. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime. <laughs> yeah. We got room. Well, if people want to follow you and learn more from you, where can they go? Um, well, you know, we have a podcast, which, you know, I, I don't talk uh, about this subject all the time. We talk about all kinds of things that are going on. But uh, I, I co-host a, a podcast called Liberty Station on Salem's Network. I co-host it with Pastor Rob McCoy. And, uh, and we have a good time. Interesting guests talking about interesting things and interesting topics. So. Yeah. Well, I always love talking to you about anything that has to do with safety, security, guns. And so this was a great conversation, and I'm glad that our audience got to hear it as well. So thanks for coming in, and thank thanks. you all for listening. See you next time.